It's my role in the BFI National Archive to create automation workflows, and this includes all stages from conceptualization, creation and test to live implementation. The scripts I write now are directly helping create channels to manage this increased throughput of data, while the documentation that is generated as a result of this process provides necessary transparency for long-term archival access. Bottlenecks are a problem for many archives. Alongside our desperate need to digitise obsolete videotape formats, there's increasing demand for larger film scanning resolutions, which, as we've seen, create massive file sizes. I feel there will need to be more developer archivist roles in the future of audiovisual archiving, and any one of you here could be interested in this path, but doubt your suitability because, like me, you don't have formal computer science training. I want to reassure you that this shouldn't be an obstacle to your interest. Approximately 90% of workflow creation doesn't actually involve writing any code at all, but is more an exercise in communication skills, research, problem solving and good documentation. I thought for this second demonstration, it could be helpful to review one of my latest Python transcoding scripts, as if it's a current project in development, and share some approaches I use when writing scripts. This one was recently written to convert FFE1 Matroska files to V210 MOVs for archive partners in our Heritage 2022 videotape preservation project. So let's look at how I break this process down. Project specifications. What are the issues faced by colleagues or stakeholders that this individual script or workflow needs to provide a solution for? So points to consider include the video files they submitted for digitization will vary between formats and so will possibly vary digitally by interlacement and field order, pixel dimensions and colour information. As a result, the script needs to sense these differences and ensure this information is carried to the V210 mob file correctly along with the correct metadata expressions. The script needs to target a specific supplier folder in the transcode storage, allowing for minimum operational impact to colleagues. The script needs to run independently, sensing when new files arrive in this destination, and critically they must check that files are still not copying or moving into a folder before processing. Ideally, the project should utilise existing open source tools available through command line interface, so the scripts can batch automate all stages of metadata assessment, transcoding and file verification for the FFV1 Matroska and the V210 MOV. Research. So we have our project outline. Next, there's a period of research. This section has broad scope and is really critical in ensuring the project is viable. It can be hard to know where to start when faced with so many complex facets, but here's how I tend to approach it. Build environment. For me, it begins with the anticipated build environment for running this script. For a new project, this could mean starting from scratch by sourcing a computer server that allows you root admin privileges to install open source softwares and the latest version of Python and libraries that you'll need. Installation and test of these software components. This period needs to include installing any software you want to use in your script. And for this, I recommend package managers like Homebrew for Mac and Linux or Chocolatey for Windows 7 Plus. They take a lot of the anxiety out of open source software installation. They automate the installation upgrade, config, and if required, the clean removal of programs from a computer's operating system in a consistent and safe manner. Once a package manager is installed, you can use very simple commands to install and upgrade software, and you can use both of these package managers safely to install FFmpeg and media area tools. When you have the tools installed, then the fun begins testing some of the potential commands needed to achieve your goals. For this, you can find some excellent blogs and training sites online provided by the AV preservation community, including the wonderful FF Improviser, which walks you through the beginnings of writing a command and supplies a myriad of AV preservation command solutions to get you started. It even gives you commands for generating video and image sequences that you can use in your tests. Review your limitations. It might be at this stage you find limitation in the tools you're testing and you need to discuss how this could impact your file creation and whether this is a stumbling point for your project. 
For example, FFmpeg does not offer clear aperture CLAP support for transcoding to V210 or ProRes MOV files, which prevents the file from truly meeting QuickTime's file format specifications. Out of interest, this was an issue for this script, which we finally resolved through consultation with our partner archives, problem solving and seeking specialist knowledge. It's good to be flexible at this point. If one path isn't supportable, can you try another route? This may not be as sophisticated, it may take longer to automate or even need a manual stage that uses a GUI tool, but it might still help you achieve your ultimate goal. At this point, I'd recommend taking these kinds of problems to your AV preservation community, asking for support or hiring a specialist to consult with you. There's also excellent documentation, blogs and white papers available on open source AV workflows, many of which you can find links to at AMIA's Open Workflows and Resources for AV Archiving page on GitHub. Basically, never panic that something is insurmountable. There's so much knowledge and information available to assist you that I predict someone has the answer to even your trickiest problem. Writing the script. If your research has found your goal to be viable, then it's time to break the project down into achievable workflow steps. For me, I loosely use what is called bottom-up programming technique that results in breaking each small task of your workflow into an individual scripted function and each function implements one specific task within the code. I really like functional programming for its transparency. It's easier to read and understand. I also like it because it makes sections of code reusable between scripts. You can cut out a function and reuse it many times, saving script writing time. Let me show you what I mean. In this transcoding script, there are 10 functions, nine of which complete specific tasks. This script is available to view from our open source transcoding repository on our GitHub. It's called batch transcode h22 ffv one v 210py So the top of the script, first thing you'll see is the shebang, which is necessary to pass information about what language is needed to read the content of the script. Next is my description of what the script does and any production notes for myself about the script. For example, if elements are time sensitive or need further development. Next are the imports. Python works by importing external modules and libraries to create code from, and they're expressed at the top of the script as an import and then the name. OS is a module that communicates with the operating system, providing essential commands such as os.makedir to create directories or os.listdir which extracts a list of contents from a directory. You can also see it being used below for the global paths where it calls os.environ to apply server-side environmental variables to the MOV policy, frame MD5 path and log variables. These are uppercase because they are global variables, meaning they are available to the whole script, as opposed to local variables, which are lowercase and only used within a function. The subprocess module you'll see is used throughout this script. This module allows the script to delegate a task to the operating system, utilising external software programs, specifically FFmpeg and Media Areas open source tools. The shootil module gives you file manipulation options, and I use it most commonly for shootil.move to move files and folders. Logging is used to generate script logs, allowing for blocks of code to raise various levels of warning for review later. You can see the logging configuration at the bottom of this image. Time is being used in this script to measure the duration of a section of code, and this is output to the logs as a tool to monitor network speeds, etc. Finally, sys is used to capture command line arguments passed to the Python script from the shell launch script. Functional programming. So let's look at the functions and the singular tasks they each perform, which united together completes our whole workflow from start to end. Each function receives one or two arguments expressed in brackets behind the name. And each function returns a result on completion, which follows a return statement at the end of the script. Get color. GetColor uses Python's subprocess module 
to call media info software to retrieve the color primaries and the color matrix data from the supplied FFV1 Matroska file. It looks for a metadata specific term using an if else control statement and returns an FFmpeg friendly version of the result in the color primaries and color matrix variables. Get interlace again uses Python's subprocess module to call media info software to retrieve interlacement details from the scan order metadata field of the FFV1 Matroska. It filters the retrieved data using an if else control statement, returning again the FFmpeg friendly equivalent in the set field variable. Change path. Depending on the supplied path and the argument, it returns a new folder path for transcoding files, moving files, failed transcode or move failure logs. Any path is created on the basis of the supplied argument, which is called use. Create FFmpeg command. This yields sections of your FFmpeg command into named variables using the specific color and interlacement details extracted earlier and the path to the file for transcoding. It starts by creating an FFmpeg output path using the change path function above and the argument transcode. Next, it creates the rest of the FFmpeg command, storing each block into descriptive variable names, which includes your new output path. It doesn't matter what order these are listed in here, as long as when they are returned at the end of the function, they are in the correct order for the FFmpeg command to be processed. Conformance check. This function uses the subprocess module to call up MediaConch software and check the new v210 mov file conforms to the BFI's mov policy, which I'll quickly show you here. This policy checks general video and audio track types, looking for v210 mov specific metadata flags, including that format is MPEG4, format profile is QuickTime, video format is YUV, video codec is v210. So if the policy gets a pass statement from the subprocess call, this pass is returned as a string from this function. If it receives any other response, such as fail, NA, or no response at all from the subprocess call, then the function returns a fail string to the script. Make frame MD5. This function generates a transcode path from the full path using the change path function. It then goes on to create two more file paths as output MKV and output MOV variables. These are the paths to the FFmpeg FrameMD5 manifests that this function creates. FrameMD5 manifests are generally used to validate lossless transcoded files like FFV1 and V210. They are like the standard MD5 checksum. However, FrameMD5 is a more granular version of the MD5 allowing frame level checksum generations for every frame of an audiovisual file. The FrameMD5 lists all the frames and their individual hex codes into one text file. As you've probably deduced, this means if there's a problem in your video file, you can exactly pinpoint where, even to a frame's video or audio stream. So this function makes a FrameMD5 manifest first of the original FFV1 Matroska and then the V210 MOV using subprocess calls for both. It then returns the two FrameMD5 manifest paths. You may note that these subprocess commands have some very long lines of code in, specifically this command here. During early tests, I was seeing multiple transcode failures from FrameMD5 comparisons with large chunks of the file's video stream returning mismatches. The issue was caused by capture card technology adding unregulated data into the YUV buffer of the video frame. The fix is to include a LUT YUV crop to remove these buffer zones when comparing the FFV1 and the V210, so the comparison is against the image itself and not the buffer zones. If you'd like to know more about this issue, please take a look at my blog post, The Case of the Failing Frame MD5, where I go into more detail. Diff check. This simple function uses subprocess to call up Linux program diff, which checks the two FrameMD5 manifest paths to see if the files are identical. 
it uses an if else control statement to return a match or fail result. Fail log. This function is responsible for creating a warning log when a transcode fails. It first looks to see if a fail log exists already. If not, it creates one. Then it appends the warning message from the failed media conch policy response for the V210 MOV. Cleanup. This function runs the conformance check of the completed V210MOV transcode using the conformance check function above. If this media conch check returns a fail string, the failure message and the file details are written to a failures log and the V210MOV is deleted. The script leaves the FFV1 Matroska in place to try encoding again. If it passes, it moves it to the success folder and then deletes the FFV1 Matroska the main function. So that's all of our single purpose functions. Many programming languages have a special function which is automatically executed when an operating system launches a script. Generally, this is called main. Python can also follow this convention and it's useful to do so when learning. To launch main, the script needs a conditional or if statement at the end, which is a bit complex to explain here, but basically this launches the script by reading through the main function from top to bottom. So the main function needs to orchestrate all of the actions that complete the workflow, and writing this section should be fairly straightforward for you. First, you need to get the file path into the script, so there is a file to process. And to do this, I've elected to use a shell launch script to retrieve a list of the file paths from our storage folder. This lets me run the Python script concurrently with GNU Parallel. Next, the script splits the file name from the file path and checks it qualifies as a correctly named file with an n underscore prefix. Next, the script cycles through the functions, extracting the interlacement and colour data from the FFE1, then passes this unique data to the create FFmpeg command, which returns the complete file specific FFmpeg call. This FFmpeg command is then launched using a subprocess call which begins encoding the FFV1 file to V210 format. This command sits between two timer markers I've named tick and tock, which analyse the start and end times for the encoding and output this to the log in minutes. When encoding is completed, the make frame MD5 function is activated to generate manifests for the FFV1 and the new V210. Before checking these two manifests are identical using the diff check function. If the frame md5s match, then the manifests are copied to storage and the cleanup function is launched to check the v210 against the media conch policy and clean up according to the results. So that's all of the script functions. And let's recap over some of the points I follow when writing these scripts. Make your script functions as singularly focused as possible to avoid any unwanted side effects. Where you can, use Python native types lists, tuples, dictionaries, and Python standard library functions over custom-made types and functions. Name your functions by what they do, and name your variables by what they are. Once you start writing lots of code, this will prove incredibly valuable. And remember, uppercase for global variables and lowercase for local variables used only within a function. Comment all your functions with a doc string. That explains clearly what the function does, what the arguments should be, and what the function should be returning. Refactor your code if you realise it's getting complicated or you have repetition. Shorten a function when necessary or move some code out of one function and into a separate function if your code repeats itself. You can write code with free open source software like Visual Studio Code, which lets you install lots of useful apps like Sorcery and the new GitHub Copilot. Both of these can help with writing and improving your code. Just make sure you understand what the changes do. Any problems? Take them to Stack Overflow. I've not had a problem yet that couldn't be resolved this way. Review and test. Now that you have something written, I recommend checking them over with tools called linters, which clean up code by looking for syntax errors, flagging orphaned variables caused by misspellings, or suggesting changes to conform to the PEP8 style guide. Now you can start your test runs, and this part is great fun when you're doing it safely. Create a safe space, copying the directory structure of your real environment as closely as you can. 
use duplicate files only or generate your own using FFmpeg for test reasons. Start running your tests manually and analysing the outcome. Review your log outputs. Do you need a more human readable log? Can you improve the layout so it's easier to read and access over time? This can be a long stage because if you're new to writing code then lots of unexpected things will occur. Warnings about installations missing, syntax or simple logic errors that you just won't see until you try to run the code. But it's also great fun and one of the best learning experiences. Moving to your live environment. Often this just means changing the script's input path from your test path to your live path. If I can have another short period of tests using duplicate files again, then I will. At this point, you'll also want to configure your scheduling for the script runs, for example, by editing your cron tab to control how frequently it runs. And finally, documentation. I break this down into categories. Script aims, methods, repository links containing the scripts, script statuses, whether they're live, development or test, server hosting the scripts, path to all the necessary scripts, path to logs and other necessary documentation, folders being targeted by active scripts, language and software dependencies, other dependencies such as externally created documentation that the scripts use, cron tab timings for the script runs, any other critical data requirements such as externally supplied vendor data and the formatting that is required for us to receive this. User guides for colleagues to understand which folders are in use by the scripts and how they should interact with them. That concludes my processes for script writing. Much of the learning I've demonstrated here today I have in turn learnt from the No Time To Wait conference community and my colleagues at the BFI. I wish to thank all those who've helped me to develop my skills and I'm equally excited to assist others in their workflow developments using these amazing open source tools. For me, open and standards-based preservation formats like FFV1 and Matroska are like rocks amid a turbulency of changing codecs. With FFmpeg and Media Area Metadata Conformance tools, they provide a solid foundation for the creation of open source microservice architectures like the scripts I've demonstrated today. And these scripts and workflows are adaptable and maintainable in-house with very few additional costs to us for maintenance or development. As and when these workflows inevitably need to evolve and increase in scale, the collections and information department will be able to meet that change with the help of a community I feel blessed to be a part of. Thank you.